something with this light here. All right, well, happy Tuesday. So we've got the syllabus to talk about, everyone's favorite topic. Um, so we're going to be here 2 to 3.15, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then back in the lab just Tuesdays like we were, uh, 12 to 1.45. Attendance is optional. I record things. I post the recordings. Um, this is your time to come and ask me questions, though. All right, I've got office hours. If you want to come to my office hours between classes, Tuesdays and Thursdays, come and hang out, ask me questions. Um, I may or may not be meeting with someone or like going and grabbing lunch, so call or text me if you don't see me up there um, in CIS 239. That's the weird brick building we passed that has no classrooms in it at all. It's just offices and a conference room and a lab. Um, it's fun. Um, when you email me, if you use the Canvas email option, it goes to my other non-priority inbox so my phone doesn't pick it up because Canvas sends me emails every time people turn, think, turn things in, which is annoying. And I, or I, I like having the email record of it. I don't want to have to go and get notified on my phone. So, But if you email me directly, it goes to my priority inbox and will come to my phone. Um, I'll see it right away. Uh, or you can call or text. This is my cell phone number. I've got a phone on campus apparently somewhere, but I've never used it in seven years. Um, so don't use it, please. You won't get a response. Um, yeah, the course description should be a copy paste. Nothing interesting here. We've got specific learning goals. You can go check out the website here for that. And then specific course objectives. These ones are actually a little bit interesting here uh, because this is things we're going to get to in the course of class. So looking at making test cases and test plans for unit and integration tests of medium-sized programs. Programs get a little bit bigger this semester than last time. We'll create stub procedures and drivers as needed to perform top-down or bottom-up integration testing of programs. How do we test things? Again, sort of related to testing. Different approaches with top-down versus bottom-up. Uh, we'll look at describing trade-off considerations for data design implementations. So one of the focuses we get into is how things perform as we work with them in memory. So there are trade-offs when we design things different ways or implement them different ways. Some things will be faster, some things will be slower. So we're going to look at what do we choose when and talk about that. Uh, we'll get into designing software that is easily modifiable. We talked about this a little bit last semester, but turns out writing software is expensive. I mean, it's, it's a relatively high demand skill with not a lot of people who know how to do it in, in terms of people who could perform tasks. So, uh, you know, with the law of supply and demand, that means software engineers get paid well, data scientists get paid well, right? That's probably one of the reasons you're getting into this field because it pays well. It's okay to admit that. Um, so when companies spend money to have something done for them, they want a return on investment. They want to spend the money and they want to get this money back because they think the product will give them more money. They'll be able to make more money or save money places. So the longer that software can be used, the more money they make off of it, the better their return on investment is. So when we design software, we want to make sure it's easily modifiable because most of the time when software exists, it's being maintained. There's the beginning when we have to design it, when we write it, and then we launch it. And then it's in maintenance for as long as businesses can do this thing before it no longer makes sense to keep investing and maintaining. And then we shut it down. It's a software development life cycle. It's a, it's a fun topic of in itself. But because it should be maintained for a long period of time, we want to make sure it's easily modifiable. So as things change, we, you know, tax codes change, whatever we need to do, we can go in and update our software. We're going to pull in new fields. We've got new information, new data we want to pull into our analysis here. We want to make sure it's modifiable. That's one of the goals. And object-oriented design helps us with that because we like using objects, and then we can pull different pieces in and out um, pretty easily there. So that's really fun. We'll look at linked list, stacks, and queues. Now, this is all already done in the Python library, but the reason why we look at how we write them is to better understand and appreciate what they're good at and what they're bad at. Right? Linked lists are really fast at some things, stacks are really fast at some things, queues are really fast at some things. Other things they don't work for. So we're gonna look at and actually write them essentially from scratch. Um, the book that we have is really big into inheritance and using a base class and then extending that base class. It's fine and it's good and that's good practice, but it's confusing. So I don't generally build them that way because then you've got three different files to look at when you want to understand what's happening somewhere. So when I write them and we kind of go through and we implement them, I'll do it in the not most efficient way coding wise because it's easier to understand what the code is doing. So it'll be a little bit different. So we've got the book for reference, but we're essentially doing what they're doing, re-implemented in a different way. Right? And it goes pretty well for us. Um, but very rarely are you ever going to build your own linked list stack or queue class. You're just going to use the built-in one because armies of PhDs have worked on these things and optimized them as much as they can be. Um, and if someone can make it even like 2% faster, they like win awards for doing these ridiculous optimizations. So it's already as fast as it's going to get in the standard library. So we don't, we're not going to build our own, but we build them so we know how they work. We understand them better ins and outs. That's why engineers build car engines that they design because 
if they ever only ever think of it theoretically, but they've never built one, they don't really understand what's all happening there. So it kind of helps you understand it better. By the way, I hate cars and I don't know how they work. <laughs> I'm not a physical engineer at all. Um, and they just they feel like cars are money pits. Uh, we're gonna incorporate various sorting algorithms into our program design. Again, there's a built-in sort. We did sort or sorted before. It's probably the best one in almost all your cases. Occasionally, you might need to use a different sort. So we'll look at different sorting algorithms. Um, we'll look at some bad ones because they're easy to write, and then we'll look at the good ones that are a little bit more confusing. Um, again, sort of model, we can build our own so we appreciate what it's doing. Um, we'll use existing class libraries to create a program using object-oriented analysis and object-oriented design techniques. So use existing stuff, use objects to create a program. It's really fun. We'll do bigger programs, essentially. Um, we'll create libraries of related classes that can be used to solve real-world problems. Now, real-world is a bit of a stretch here because this is still like our second semester coding. So we'll take a small chunk of the real world and solve very small problems. But the same process applies to bigger and bigger and bigger things. You just need more and more and more code to model it, to simulate it, those sorts of things. So I, I'm a big fan of simulations. Can I make something in the real world, simulate it in code, and then run it a bunch of times in code and see if then I can mod modify it and tweak it and do these sorts of things to, to work on it there. And again, we're just going to use the built-in libraries here. We'll make our own libraries where we need it here to solve these small problems. But the process is the same as things get bigger. Um, we'll utilize data abstraction, data hiding, functions, and inheritance. We did a little bit of this last semester. Um, we'll really take a deep dive this semester following good object-oriented practices where we give you an abstract interface to work with, all of our public functions. Here's what you should be using. Right? Python's trusty. It lets you use the, the private things, but you shouldn't. And if you use the private attributes and functions and variables, you know, your warranty is null and void. Right? Don't take the back of the case off your phone or you void your warranty, that sort of thing. Um, we'll hide the data. Again, it's all by convention. And we'll write our functions and, and take, make use of inheritance. Uh, we'll work with the Unix file system and Unix shell commands. This one is lots of fun to have done it, uh, but never again. Uh, one of the things when we get accredited by ABET, I forget what their name, Association for Something Something Technology, they, they give us our accreditation for our degrees, they look at do you teach more than one operating system? Do you teach more than just Windows? Because a lot of things we do are Windows. Uh, Macs you're fine as well. Uh, all the Python stuff will run on Macs. But we have a little intro to Unix. We do a little Unix lab and you're like, yep, yeah, check the box. We taught Unix. But it's good to know all of this stuff does work cross-platform and to have done it before to play with the command line. And then when we use the editor called v Vim or VI, then you'll appreciate all the VI jokes that you see online about programmers and how hard it is to quit VI, which it really is, uh, unless you know the secret, which is crazy. Uh, but we'll do that. We'll have fun. We'll probably use the college computers for that because it's easier. You can download all the tools on your computers. You can actually use the VPN to connect to our Unix server and run stuff on the Unix server if you want to. For what we're doing, you don't need any of that power. But it is cool later on, like in, if you're doing more advanced programs and need a lot of processing power, you can push all that off onto the Unix server and make the college resources do it for you rather than have your laptop do all this computing, which is fun. So it's useful, but we just like scratch the surface of it and say, okay, nice, come back to it later. And then we'll write medium-sized programs as part of a team. So our final project is required to be a team project. Um, generally by team, I mean pairs. Right? There's not really that much more work to do. Um, and if maybe a trio, if we have an odd number of people, we can do, but you know, a group of four is just way too much. Um, so probably pairs, maybe one trio, um, but that'll be our team project. Uh, we will do that. We'll have some time at the end of class. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. So our textbook, again, there's a, a PDF if you want to go search for it, although uh, Goodrich did a good job with his book. He should get some money for it. Um, it's just crazy expensive because it's from a publisher. Uh, but it's a good book, so we'll use that. And then I do need to check with the instructor again, but uh, they used to use it for the 350 class, the data algorithms and analysis class. They would use like the second half. We don't get into all of it. Um, and then they would continue on with their lecture notes and things. So it's good, worthwhile to have, uh, but search around if you want and save some money. We use GitHub. Hopefully you made your account in lab earlier. Um, and then I like the PyCharm IDE. I think it's fantastic. If you use other IDEs, go for it. I don't really care. You can give me Python files. It's not the end of the world. Um, but this one is, is pretty easy here. And then your grades for the class, what everyone seems to care about. So this letter scale should be standard. It should be a copy paste from the template here. Uh, but 15% of your score comes from the labs. Uh, again, if you had me last semester, labs are essentially participation. The, the goal is you get them done, right? If you don't get them done, it's because you didn't try. Right? If you're there and trying, I will help you get it done, right? But, that's the point, is, is that this is your chance to practice the things we've talked about. 
Um, we've got quizzes every week on the chapters. So after Thursday, I'll post the quiz. After we've covered the chapter, you'll have until next Thursday to get it done. It's open book, open notes. The goal of the quizzes is to get you to read the book. I'll be honest. Like I, I want you to go and read the book. Now, reading doesn't mean you have to read and memorize every word. Right? But it's slightly more than you're reading just the bold words or reading just the, the paragraph headings. Right? You have to do some reading and, and know where to go find more information if it comes up. Um, so that's the goal of the quizzes. Our individual projects, the four individual projects we'll do every other week or so, are worth 25% of your score overall. We'll have one exam of the midterm, only worth 10% of your grade. Um, I don't like exams. I think they're stupid. This will also be open book and open notes because no one has ever told me in the industry that I should do something off of memory because that would be dumb. Because no one's going to memorize everything, right? We've got tools for a reason because they make us more efficient. Um, and then the final project is worth 40% of your score. This is in lieu of a final exam. We'll do our final project with our partner here. You can't pass the class without this one, right? And there'll be some specific requirements around commits and how much work we're putting into it over time. Uh, the, the goal of that is to keep you from asking the chatbot for an answer and copy pasting it in the last day. Right. And this is what we should be doing. We should be working on it incrementally throughout uh, the last month here, doing a little bit of work at a time, a little bit of work at a time, a little bit of work at a time. It was not so bad, I promise. Um, we'll get there. All right. So the tentative schedule, assuming I got my dates right here, um, this is the Tuesday, Thursday lecture. So we'll do the course intro, GitHub, Python basics. So chapter one, if you didn't have 1501, read chapter one. If you had 1501, just kind of flip through it real quick. It goes real fast. Um, you don't need to do much reading here. That's like a Python primer chapter, essentially. So if people have done programming but not in Python, they can flip through chapter one and pick up some of the basics. Um, he does get into some of the things he uses specifically. Uh, he's very particular about his syntax. I dislike it, <laughs> but I just find it confusing. That's all. Yeah. Although we have the whole week to take the quiz, yeah. is it timed? No. No, so open it, read the questions, come back to it later anytime you want. Yeah, they're untimed. One attempt only or? Just one attempt, yeah. Oh. Yep. Uh, then we'll get into chapter two next week into object-oriented programming, a little bit of refresher, and we'll take a deeper dive into in the inheritance side of things. And this will be our first project we'll do on inheritance and object-oriented programming. Uh, the week after that, we'll get into recursion and then array-based sequences. We use the Python list essentially for everything because it's awesome and, and fast already. Uh, we'll look at the specific array-based sequence. Um, other languages are a little bit more particular around how they work with arrays and whether or not they're fixed in size or not. We've got the advantage in Python that we have lists. Um, and then the week after that we'll do stacks, queues, and this is pronounced dex, someone told me, not dq. I thought it was dq. Uh, apparently it's dec. Sure, uh, that's fine. Uh, we'll look at those particular data structures. So our second project we'll do this week, week four, and the next project week six. Um, and then every other week or so we would do the projects. So um, then we'll come into linked lists. This is a really interesting topic. They're a very specialty use case. They're really good at some things and really bad at other things. So if it fits our use case, then it's a great data structure to use. If it doesn't, then we don't use it, that's all. Um, we'll start talking about trees and we get more into other, this is a more generic kind of tree and we'll get into specific trees later. Uh, the academic calendar calls this week, the end of February, first week of March, spring recess. I, I object to that being called spring because that is still solidly winter here in Michigan. But they called it spring. Um, I apologize. So I copy pasted there. Um, after spring recess, we'll come back. We'll do midterm review and the midterm exam. So the idea, we'll do review on the Monday, or I'm sorry, the Tuesday, um, and then we'll do the midterm exam itself on the Thursday. Um, generally, I don't like watching people take tests and I don't time them anyway. So the plan is You'll just take it any time you want, um, but this one will be limited to the hour 15 or so period. That is, you can get it done in that amount of time. If you don't like Thursdays at 2 p.m., you'll have up until like the next week to get it done. So start at whatever hour 15 minutes you prefer. If you like evenings, take it in the evening. If you like mornings, take it in the morning. Yeah. So it's going to be pretty similar to the last one, right? Yeah. Yeah, very similar. I'll give you last year's midterm because I have to rewrite them every time. Not that you folks would do it, uh, but other unscrupulous people have posted stuff to like Course Hero or Chegg or other places, which is actually a violation of our academic integrity policy. You can't share course material without permission, and I don't give people permission to post my stuff on Chegg because they're a terrible website and hope they go out of business. Um, but you don't share things like that. Right? that. That's a violation of policies. But people have done that, so they tell us we should rewrite our exams every semester. So I rewrite or every every time you give them. So I rewrite it every year. Uh, but I'll give you last year's. You can see what the questions are. It's meant to be short, right? You should be able to get it. I aim for you to be able to get it done in like half an hour or so, maybe 45 minutes, and then we've got the full hour 15. So that one is timed in Canvas. Once you hit start, it's got to be done within 75 minutes or so. 
Um, I, might, I might even go out to 90 minutes because I don't have to sit and watch you take it, but um, the goal is it's pretty short. Um, but that's our only exam style assessment here. We'll do the review that Tuesday um, and we'll have some time to work on it. Um, then we finish out the more advanced topics. Now after the midterm, we only sort of touch on these topics. We're not gonna go super deep because you, these are gonna come up again later in 350, algorithm analysis and design. Sort of like in 150 or 1501, we touched on a couple topics that we're gonna deep dive on now. We do the same thing. We're gonna touch on a couple topics that you'll deep dive in the next class to sort of give you a little primer on what's coming up. Um, so we'll get into priority queues, maps, hash tables, and skip lists. We basically skip skip lists, but it's in the chapter. Um, and then search trees is a huge topic. This is one of the, the starting things you do in the 350 class, data structures analysis. Um, trees are amazing. Tons of things run on trees in the real world. Um, so they're really cool. And then a little bit on sorting and selection. And actually one of my favorite topics, which you think is really boring, but is super interesting, is ethics. I've got just some notes uh, from Dr. Ellen Bogan that he let me use when we talk about ethics, and there's tons of things online we're gonna use. And that'll be the last bit of material, the last week of class I've got set aside for final project work time. And we'll have some time in here these other days because again, we're not going super deep on the topics. So the last month or so, the goal is I think this week, week 11 or so, I'll assign the final project. So you've got a month to work on it. So I think that is the every other week format, right? So if we do from two to four, four to six, six to eight, oh, that was the recess of so nine, it's the review, so 10 to 12, okay. Uh, we might do it week 12 then, because we'll start the project three, week 10, the last project, and then they'll be due the t week 12. So that gives you almost a month, right? From the tw 26th to the 23rd to work on it. I think that's pretty good. So we'll have time this week, that week, the ethics week. Uh, we definitely don't need two sessions on ethics, so we'll have some more final project work time there as well. Um, yeah, so it should go pretty well. So you can get together. Ideally, you can get it done before finals week, so you can focus on your other class finals. That's the goal. It doesn't always happen, but that's the goal. You know, we can kind of work through it, get it done, out of the way. Um, and then we're presenting the 23rd at 3 p.m., if I did this right, because our class is Tuesday at 2, so we should be Group G, and Group G is... Tuesday the 23rd at 3 p.m. Best I know how to read this thing, because it doesn't count lab times, it counts lecture times. I got confused on that before and did it wrong one year. Um, but that should hopefully prevent any conflicts, because uh, you'll be presenting your work. It's a good habit or a good skill to, to practice. Some people hate presenting, and that's okay. Uh, but in the real world, you're going to show your work to your colleagues. Say, hey, this is what I worked on, and get some feedback on it right, before anything goes out and gets launched to production. Hopefully you get some more eyes on it. It's actually really scary to like push code out to people if no one else has looked at it. So you're like, I hope I did it right. <laughs> um, so getting some review time, that's what it's meant to be, more of just a review of is, what is it doing, show off the different features here. I might have a couple questions about the code. It was pretty chill last semester, right, for presentations. Worked out pretty well. All right, you guys did great on that. Um, so that's the plan. Um, for academic integrity, so specific to my course here, um, the, viol the result of violating the academic integrity policy is failure in the class. And hopefully everyone appreciates this because this is a good thing. If people cheat and get degrees, when they go and get hired in the industry, they're gonna get fired because they don't know anything because they cheated their whole way through school. And then that employer will say, hey, U of M Dearborn does a terrible job educating people, don't hire graduates from them, which is bad for all of us, right? So we don't want cheaters to get degrees, we want them to fail because they actually need to do the work and learn the stuff so that they can do the work in industry and people think we did a good job educating people who want to hire other U of M Dearborn graduates, right? There's the, the, the bit of, uh, is it, uh, people say that the block M letter has, has value in this area. People send them to respect U of M. Well, we like to keep it that way, right? And not just let people pass by cheating. Is that pretty fair? Okay, um, so most commonly what happens is plagiarism, right? Plagiarizing is presenting someone else's work and putting your name on it. Right? People do it all the time. There's a, a joke about Stack Overflow. Uh, it's the Stack Overflow keyboard. Um, notice the date here. They, they published this. This is actually an April 1st article. Uh, I think timing-wise I got off here. Uh, it's the copy-paste keyboard. The joke. People do it in the industry all the time. But generally you still cite your source. We say, hey, this is where I got the material from because you need to go back in case it doesn't work for you. In academia, you cite your source because that's what you do. You have to cite your source and say, this is where I got the idea from, it wasn't mine. Whether or not we're paraphrasing it, we'll say, okay, I adapted work from here, here's my source, or hey, it's just a copy paste, here's an algorithm. The common one, how do you find a prime number, right? Don't go write that yourself. It's not worth your time to figure out how you find out if the number's prime or not. Just go Google, how do you find a prime number in Python? 
Or go ask the chatbot, how do you find a prime number in Python? Perfectly fine, right? And you just take that and we're gonna cite our source and we're good to go, right? That, that's okay. But if you don't cite your source and you give me some bit of code that obviously is not second semester code, I know you didn't write it because no one writes code that looks like this or, or very few people remember that you can stop at the square root of a number when you're looking to see if it is divisible by something else. Almost no one has ever given me that. I think one person, because they were actually a math major taking Python, they're like, hey, I'm a math major. I know these sorts of things. It's like, why is that in your head? <laughs> But okay, you know, people have all sorts of interesting things in their head. So um, we don't cheat. We don't plagiarize. If you get something online, just cite it. That's fine, including our chatbot. Um, U of M has their own chatbot tool, and it's using version 4 of the uh, GPT-4, whatever. I, I can't even keep up with it nowadays. It's like changing every day um, for free that you can use with your U of M account. Now, this one doesn't give you links to your conversation like OpenAI does, so citing it is a little bit tricky. So what I'm asking you to do is cite it, including the prompt you used. And that could be like five different questions. That's perfectly fine. So we'll just put a comment in and say, hey, this is what I asked, this is what I asked, this is what I asked, this is what I asked. Here's, here's what I got from the chatbot, whether or not it's a direct copy-paste or it's, I've adapted it from the, the chatbot response. That's fine. Now, I, I will warn you right now, it is really bad at math, right? The, Large language models are designed to be um, prose machines. They're to generate something that looks like language. When it comes to math, it's like, hey, this looks like math. It can't solve three-digit numbers times three-digit numbers most of the time because it just generates something. This looks like it might be a right answer. And it gives you, like, the math. Have you seen, have you played with it? Like, hey, solve this problem, show me your work. And it just generates nonsense. It's really funny. Um, so bad at math things. So it's, it's very good, it's a very powerful tool, useful, but we need to learn to use it the right way. Right? We're gonna use it to make us faster and more efficient and better programmers, because good programmers are lazy. We're not gonna do work that we don't need to do. So if the chatbot can give us something to start with, let's go for it. And then we're gonna actually make sure it works and does what it's supposed to do and tweak the things we need to tweak, right? Um, but just like English papers, you don't turn in one giant quotation, right? You have to have original effort added to call it your work, otherwise it's Hey, so this is someone else's thing. Even if you quote the entire thing, you can never turn that in, right? You, you, you can't turn in, hey, here's the English paper someone else wrote. It's in quotes, I cited my source. Obviously that won't fly, right? Same thing for our programs. So I, I don't know exactly what the rules are when it comes to English, because it's been a long time since I've had to write English paper, but I'm gonna tell you, you need about 50% of your own work. 50% right? of your own original effort. You can cite the other 50%, that's perfectly fine. Hey, here's where I started with, here's the work I added. Here's my original work that I've added to it, right? And I'm happy with that, because that shows you can use the tools to help you solve problems, but you're not only using the tool, right? Because that sort of thing, if you get out to the real world and you don't know how to code, because all you do is copy paste from the bot, when it can't answer your question, you're gonna be out of luck, because it can't do everything for us. It does a lot of things, but when we get into real complex, real world situations, it has no clue, right? It's gonna generate something that looks like it might be correct. And if you don't know how to check it, if you don't know how to see, is it doing what it's supposed to do, we're gonna have bad stuff and bad things will happen, right? I think I mentioned I'm diabetic. So, you know, an app on your phone, if the game crashes or it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, no one cares that you got the wrong number of points. It's, it's a stupid game. But in my insulin pump here, if it gives me the wrong amount of insulin, I will literally die. It, it's a very serious thing, depending on what applications we're writing uh, to make sure that our code is correct. So we don't wanna just take the chatbot answer and say, yeah, this is fine. That doesn't fly, all right? So, sorry, that's a little soapbox of mine. Uh, it really irritates me when people cheat. I don't catch everybody, I'm gonna be honest. I'm sure people have cheated in my class and I didn't notice. But every semester that I've taught since 2012, I've had to fail at least one person for cheating. It's really depressing. It irritates me because I, I have to fill out a lot of paperwork is why it irritates me. Like I have to document all these different things, show them what was turned in, show them the source it came from so that the dean can look at it and be like, oh yeah, it's obvious they cheated. Rather when I look at it, like I know they cheated. They're like, how do you know? okay, here's the 30 pages of documentation to show. Like this is, it's, it's a bunch of nonsense and I hate it. Then I complain to my wife and my wife complains that I'm complaining and it's unhappy, right? And it's no good, just, like, just let it go. So um, just a, a fun story on a, an exam, because they're open book, open notes, eight people turned in the exact same answer. I'm like, hey, that's a little weird, right? One of the eight people cited their source. Say, hey, I found this answer online. Here's what I, here's where I got it from. It's like, okay, cool. You cited your source, we're good. That's fine. You, you do what you're supposed to do. The other seven people didn't cite their source. So seven people failed the class for cheating. This was the final exam. 
turns out these classes are like prerequisites for other classes. So they had already registered for the next semester and couldn't take that next class without passing this one. So they all had to go talk to the dean. They're like, oh, we cheated and failed the class. And the dean was like, okay, well, the schedule's already set, but you can take it as independent study style. And they're like, well, who can teach independent study style? The dean was like, hey, Eric, can you teach it? So they paid me to teach them again to retake the class and not cheat. So like, I made money off the deal for failing people, which was funny. I'm glad you think that's funny too. That's good. <laughs> I feel a little bad sometimes saying that, but like they cheated on the final exam, so they had to retake the class, and it was, it was stupid. Like just don't cheat, all right? It, it's not worth it. Okay? If you don't want to be here, don't be here. It's as easy as that. I don't care if you're here or not. I'll be honest. Right? Just don't come. If you want to learn something and practice and try it, and and have me here to answer your questions, that's what I'm here for. Okay? If you just want to get your your piece of paper, go away. That, that's not the goal here. Right? All right, um, late work. Generally, I don't accept without prior written approval because I go over solutions. So I didn't put the schedule in here, I'm sorry. Uh, but after projects are due, they're due just before class starts, and then I go over the solution in class. The idea is the way I approach problems, I want to show you this is how I would solve it. It's okay if it's not the way you solved it. That's perfectly fine. Programming is very much an art as it is a science. Right? There's different ways of taking big problems and breaking them down into smaller and smaller and smaller problems and solving them. And having almost 20 years experience, I approach things differently. Right, so I'll give you the, the assignment, you'll go, do a work on the project for two weeks, you'll turn it in, and then I'll go over the answer. Um, and then you're grading yourself. Right? So it, I'll give you the rubric, you'll go through, hey, here's where I got the points for this, and you'll show me, here's the screenshot of it running doing this thing. Here's the rubric item, here's my program doing it, here's where I get the points for this thing. So you'll assess yourself, um, which is, works out really well, is that way you're making sure you're doing all the things. Right? You've got a rubric, it's really easy, yes it did it or no it didn't. Or, hey, I got it sort of working, it kind of works, but I get errors sometimes. I, that always confuses me when people turn stuff in that only sort of works because I'm like, well, what, did you ask me in the last two weeks what was wrong? It's like, I'm not going to tell you to go away. If you're having a problem and you're getting an error, ask me. I will get you pointed in the right direction to get it fixed. I'm not going to give you the code to fix it necessarily, right? but I'll help you. Right? That's what I'm here for. Anybody can buy the book and go through material. You're ideally paying to have someone who has expert knowledge help you learn it. That's sort of the idea with higher education. I mean, it's a bit of a scam, but this is what it is now. Um, this is the system we live in. Um, so I'll help you with it. If you get stuck, that's okay. Things happen. You don't get it all the way done. I get it, right? Life happens. I've got seven kids. I'm super busy. Um, so sometimes things fall through the cracks. That's okay. Uh, but I'm here to help. Um, so don't turn it in late because we go over answers. And once an answer is published, I won't take yours because right, that's not fair to everyone else. Um, so start early if possible to avoid anything. Um, commit early and often to GitHub. It's free to commit, aside from the you know, little bit of energy resources people burn places in the data center out in the cloud, but it's free for us. We, we don't pay any cost to commit. And that avoids issues like, hey, it crashed on my laptop, right, that sort of thing. Um, for the student food pantry, um, this is actually really cool. There's this cool guy named Maslow. He has this hierarchy of needs. He's a, a psychology guy, right? I think that's right. So the idea here is certain things have to be met before you can do other things, the sort of pyramid of needs here. So psychological things like having food and water and sleep and shelter are important and the base foundation before you can do anything at this top level, things that are creative. Because programming is creative, right? it's the art of solving problems here, you have to have all this other stuff in place before you can be successful at this. right? So that's where we've got the student food pantry. It's one resource to help with this sort of thing. You know, it's, it's one little bit here, uh, but that's available to you. Um, give them a call or drop in. I, I don't know what their hours are, but you can email them. That's a fantastic resource. Um, we still have this COVID policy, but I record all the classes. I don't record labs because that's just work time. I don't generally teach during lab time. I might give a little bit of code example, uh, but I'll publish that on GitHub. Uh, but all the lectures are recorded. So if you're sick, don't come. Right? I have enough germs at home with my seven kids. I don't need yours. Um, just watch the recording, ask me if you have questions afterward, and thank you for not coming when you're sick. Uh, winter is rough enough, so we'll be good. Um, and then other university-wide policies, they are linked in Canvas. Um, I think I did mention I'm a runner. I en enjoy running marathons. Uh, it's just a fun challenge. It gets me out, gets me some exercise, and it's a nice quiet time because it's really loud at home. Um, so that being said, if there is any sort of safety issue, our policy here is run, hide, and fight. I think is what it is, it's the three things. I'd have to go look again, I apologize. Uh, but run is my favorite option. If it's not in our building, I am out the door, headed to my car, good luck to you. I have no responsibility for you, right? You're adults, this is college. I don't think I could make it as a K-12 educator where I have to be responsible for children's safety. That would drive me crazy. Like, 
I don't think I could do it, I'll be honest. So um, if something happens, we get the emergency alerts on our phone, I'm gone, okay? I'm just giving you a fair word. I'm sorry, like this is the world we live in. Again, it sucks and it's terrible, um, but this, this is the plan, okay? If it's our building, then we lock our doors down and barricade things. We've got tables and chairs and uh, we pray. Um, aside from that, good luck, right? Um, sorry, that's, okay. Um, cool. So we can talk about the um, GitHub again and some Python basics. We'll do, this actually went really quick. Um, we, I think we can probably actually start chapter two probably on Thursday then, because I don't think we need to do the whole week for this. Uh, is that, that okay? So we'll bump this up just a little bit. Um, should be fine. Um, inheritance is a big topic, so it's good we'll have a little extra time to work on that. Um, let me go through again. So for the recording here, um, I'll go through what the lab exercise was. We did the lab earlier today. Thanks for coming. Hopefully you saw the note, um, but that's, that's all pretty good there. Um, so the idea with Git is it's a distributed source control system. So if you have a Git repository, it's just a folder. But what Git does is it's tracking all of the files at that point in time in that folder. And we can make a commit. A commit is a snapshot that says, this is what the files look like at this point in time. Okay, let me go close that door. So we're going to use a Git repository, which is just a folder, for each of our labs and each of our projects. It just helps keep them organized and gets us practice with this Git workflow. So Git was created by uh, Linus Torvald, the founder of Linux, when he decided that the previous existing source control tools were not good enough, which is true. They, they all sucked compared to Git. So Git is the most widely used source control tool in the world nowadays. GitHub is a hosting provider of the tool. It gives you a cloud-based central repository and all these cool web tools, and they give it away for free for educational use. And I like free things. Free is pretty good. Um, so we'll use this classroom github.com link, which will make a private repository for you that you have access to and I have access to. So that way you don't have to make your own repositories and you don't have to give me access to them. And you don't want to make public repositories for your schoolwork because if someone turns in your code, I'm going to think you cheated too, right? So when your, when your classmates ask you, hey, I just want to see how you did it, tell them to get lost or wait until after you've turned it in, right? Like after the due date. So if someone just wants to see your code, they, they want to copy off you. Right. You're welcome to talk about things in English. Like, hey, how did you solve this problem? Oh, well, I had a class that had these attributes. Perfectly fine. You know, we can chat in English all we want. Share ideas. That's fantastic. But when we start sharing code, we've gone too far with that, right? So talk about things. I've got the Discord server set up. I posted the link um, for it here. You can join the Discord server. It is public. Like, I invite all my classes to it. So use whatever handle you want. You don't have to have your name in there. Um, you should be fine. Um, so we've got the repository, you go and click the link, and then I actually did this one already from the lab computer, but you go to code, say open with GitHub desktop, and it will make a copy of that folder now. It says, hey, I'm gonna take this repository on this website, and I'm gonna put it here. Most of the time it defaults to your documents folder in a GitHub folder, and then the name of the repository. Defaults are great. You can put it anywhere you want, you just need to know where it is later. So I'll say clone. Now I have a copy of the entire history of this repository. So I can click on the history tab here and I can see all the different commits I did. So I can see the lab zero commit and I can see the updated readme where I added my image, the two different commits I made. So commits are just snapshots of this is what the folder looks like at this point in time. Right? And if you've got a commit, you can always go back to it. Um, it's possible if you use the right magic commands that you Google online to erase commits I don't recommend you run git commands that you find online. Right? Not until you've been doing it for a long time and understand what they do. Right? That sort of thing. Don't just run things you find online. That's probably a pretty good safety process. Right? That's, that's just a good habit. When it comes to git, the wrong commands can delete the history, which is not what you want to do. Right? We, we like having the history here. The history is useful. That sort of thing. So. Um, yeah, the, the GitHub desktop client will make sure we don't do that. And again, that's why I recommend everyone use the GitHub desktop client instead of the other tools. It's, it's very easy and simple and keeps things pretty straightforward. Now, it's going to give you a button here, open in JetBrains PyCharm Community Edition. This one doesn't work for us yet because we haven't made a project yet. So the it's a very handy button. We would love to use it, but you can't click it right away. So what you want to do is we're going to go make the project first. So I already did the project, right? I started by one, I can go open the project here. 
um, in my users documents uh, github that's that is my documents folder documents there it is did I click the wrong one I must have clicked the wrong one documents so here's winter lab zero right and I downloaded this I have to trust the project so my project is in a folder called lab zero so right now it's actually unhappy because I have a lab zero folder inside of another repository folder that has some code here it's a little bit confused so I really wanted to open just the lab zero project lab zero is the project if you look at what's in here you say show an explorer now I have a dot idea folder this dot idea folder tells PyCharm it's a pro it's a project PyCharm project inside of lab zero I have another one so now I have two and if I look at my github history it added a bunch of stuff here now I really have two projects I don't need two projects so I'm gonna go and close this here and with Git, I can say, let's just discard the changes. Go back, undo everything that was changed here. We'll discard all those changes here. And one more to discard. I'm gonna try one more time. So I'm gonna go back to uh, PyCharm. And, no, I didn't want that one open. Okay, let me close the project. Close project. Discard again. It's trying to be too helpful, sorry. All right, so now we're going to open. So instead of opening that folder here, I'm going to open the lab zero folder, which is the project that I created. Now I just have the lab zero project folder here, and now there should be nothing new in GitHub. Okay, if you want to go through and use the existing thing, we can do that as well. But because I have a project inside of a project or inside of a folder, right? I had lab zero inside of this repository folder. This button here that says open in JetBrains opens the repository folder where there isn't a project. So depending on how we go and make our project, what, what folder we put it in, will determine whether or not this button works for us. So if we, want, if we want this button to work, then I need to go and make a project in that folder. So when I do my new project, uh, that's not the right folder, hang on. Um, okay, I'm gonna change my location. Oh, it's not in OneDrive, there we go. Just in Documents, GitHub. If I pick my folder here, CIS 2001, Winter 2024, Lab Zero, Eric Chinesky, right, your username here. If this is the project I create, and I don't put in slash Lab Zero or something, or Project One or Project whatever, if I just leave it as the repository folder, now it's going to work for me because it will make that file, and I don't need a main welcome script because we already have one, it will make the project and say, hey, there's already a file here, do you want to use it? Yes, let's use that one. So we'll create from the existing sources here. So now I'll have a project that uses that main PY file that was empty for us. We don't need the starter one, right? Now I have this main PY file and now my button open in PyCharm will work for me. Hang on, uh, there it goes. So now we get to see all these other projects here. Here's lab zero again, we'll commit and push. So once you've made the project in this repository folder, right? Not inside of a folder inside the folder, but right at the repository. Now I can say open in PyCharm. And it will open the repository folder as a project. Now my shortcut works. So clone the repository, make the project, then you can click the button. Right? If we just clone it and click the button, it's not gonna do what we want it to do for us right away because um, we want this project here at this level. Okay. So putting lab zero inside of it was actually a little bit an extra step we didn't need to. It made a little bit more work for us. Okay. So I would put it in this main file. I can copy paste this here. And we can give it a run, make sure it works. It runs for me and grab my screenshots and we're happy. Again, it's running the Python executable behind the scenes out of my little virtual environment here. And it's pointing it at this Python file. It goes and interprets the file, reads it. Um, it's a little bit misleading. So there are different kinds of languages. I generally say Python is an interpreted language because it runs and reads the file as it goes. Parts of it are technically compiled, so it's a, a bit weird. Other languages, like C++, when you compile your program, it turns it into machine-readable code. Python never has a machine-readable code output. We only ever have Python files that are human-readable that we tell Python to go and read and execute. It's a little bit of a distinction, uh, not too bad. People who like to optimize things and make things really fast will tend to use lower-level languages, like C or C++, because that will give you the the compiled machine readable code that's not human readable it's not in english anymore um, and they can make things really fast 
most of the time we're fast enough in Python. There's a couple things it's not really good at and the fine folks at Python have figured out a way to make it use the fast stuff, which is really cool. It's a little bit crazy when you go down that rabbit hole, but that's okay. Um, so that's the GitHub process. Right? And then we'll go and commit our changes. Here's you know, uh, lab zero done. We'll commit, push our change so it gets out to the website. If this idea file changes again, it's fine. Just let it change. It doesn't really matter um, if that one changes or not. Then I can go grab a screenshot. That's Windows Shift S if you like shortcuts. Grab my screenshot. Come back out here, go to view on GitHub. And I can go and add the screenshot in. I already have it here, but you can go edit the readme file, go down a couple lines, and you paste in an image, and it will add the image for you right away. You can just say we updated the readme, it's fine. And now I've got another screenshot here of it running. So this is what we'll do for every lab. We'll show a screenshot of it running. For every project, we'll go line by line in the rubric, say this is it did this piece of the rubric, it did this piece of the rubric, this piece of the rubric, right? To show the details. Next week when we get to the first project, it'll make a little more sense when we have a rubric to look at. And I'll kind of talk you through those steps. Uh, but we'll get there as we go. All right. You folks are doing great. We're doing really good. Um, what other projects are going to be on? Uh, objects and inheritance. So we'll do a deeper dive in inheritance. Yep. Yeah, because we, we did just a little bit um, last time around. Right? We talked about it. I don't think we used it in the project at all, though, right? What about recursion? We'll, we'll do a project in recursion as well. Yep. It'll be fun. It's lots of fun. Uh, May solving is everyone's favorite thing. So recursion is actually really bad for maze solving, but it's easy for us to think about. Um, the better maze solvers are a little bit more complex. Um, so that's generally more of a like intro to AI sort of topic. Um, I think they still teach uh, maze solving in that. So pathfinding is really fun, really cool stuff. Uh, like how you optimize pathfinding for things, especially in games. You have to find lots of paths in games and things. Um, yeah, lots of fun stuff there. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, we'll go over it. There's a whole chapter on it we get into. Yep. yep. We'll do more than just our Fibonacci stuff, for sure. All right, so I think, did I make my, I don't think I made the class repository yet. So let me go and um, I'm going to make a repository for our class. So all the code examples I do in class, I'll put in a public repository for you folks. So let me go make a new repository. Um, this one, you're, you're welcome to make a copy of if you want. It's usually easier to just view it on the website and copy paste it into the code if you want it. Because if you make a copy of it, then you can pull changes down as I change it, but you can never push to it because it's not your repository. You won't have access to it. So it gets a little confused when you start making changes. Um, so generally copy paste is a little bit easier. This is 2001 for winter 2024. Let it read me. I need the Python template to ignore things. And then I pick the MIT license just because it's easy. Um, and it's essentially all examples from books and things that we've done before. Um, I don't care if anyone wants to use it. It's nothing very interesting. Um, it's, I'm not making money off of this. They, they pay me to teach, not to, to, for the code I write. Um, all right, so this is the public course repository. So I'll add a link here in Canvas for this here. This is our course repository. Why does tab not work for that? Course repository. So everything I do will go here. Canvas is a terrible place to put code. Please don't put code in Canvas. Email is a terrible place to put code. Please don't email me code. If you have a question about your code, commit it to GitHub and send me a link. Say, hey, you know, my code here at this line, right? If I go back to that lab assignment here that I had. Um, the cool thing with GitHub is when you go to your Python files, you can click on the line number and it gives you a link right to line four. You can say, hey, Eric, I'm getting an error, I'm having some trouble or something's not working, this line. And you can send me this link here in Discord or email it to me or, or something. Um, you can even text it to me, but it's hard to view code on my phone. Um, right? You can send me right where it needs to be for your code because it's on GitHub and I can view the code. Honestly, at this point, and we're not doing anything super crazy, most of the time I can just look at your code and I know what's wrong. I don't even need to run it. Right? If I need to go run it, then I can clone your repository and hit run and run it and debug and figure out what's happening. But sending me GitHub links is so much nicer and easier. I don't need to download things. I don't need to copy paste it into PyCharm. Right? You, you just send it to me online and I can view it. So that's why GitHub is another great tool. It makes life easier for all of us. So if you get your code in GitHub and you're having problems, send me a link to this particular, hey, line four, line 27, whatever it happens to be. Here's where I'm having issues. Um, I've had students before, they use their cell phone and they take pictures and they're like, hey, here's a, a picture of my screen and what's going on here? Why is it, why is it not working? Why is my power not on? I just noticed my laptop's on battery power. That's not good. It uh, does not run very long without the power, sorry. No, I'm plugged in, right? That's unfortunate. 
Is that plug band? It worked before. Hang on, just give me one second. Let's try this one more here. Is that going? There it goes. Okay, so it's just the plug in the table doesn't work. That's lovely. Okay. <laughs> sure. All right, so anyway, so get your code out of here in GitHub. Um, when I do examples in class, right, I'll put it all in this main class repository. So we'll do we'll do our Hello World project because everyone starts with Hello World because that's fun. So I've got a copy of the repository. Nope, I didn't make it yet today. I got distracted. All right, so I'm going to go make the clone here. I'll say, yep, I want to open it in GitHub Desktop, put it in my Documents GitHub folder. Life is good. Now, for this class repository, I'm going to put every project inside of one repository so you don't have 15 different links to look at every week. When you do your projects, you're going to put each project in its own repository, and then you'll have 15 different links. Um, <coughs> that's okay. It's, it's just a way to organize things, but I don't want to have to have 15 different course repository links for you. Does that make sense? So I'll put a bunch of projects in one folder. You'll put one project per repository. Um, so it keeps things organized a little bit better. Um, all right, so now I've got it here. I can go back to PyCharm. And I'm gonna make a new project in that folder. So I'm gonna pick not PyCharm projects. There we go. So this is 2001 for winter 2024. Now, if I don't give it a folder name here, it puts it right in this folder, right? like we want to do for labs and projects. But because I'm putting lots of projects in this folder, I'm going to give it a project name like Hello World or something. Again, that's all it's doing. I'm using the virtual environment, which is great. It'll make a new copy of Python every time. You can use the same virtual environment over and over and over, but generally you just don't want to use the system one because as we start adding libraries to do fun things, you don't want to gunk up your system version of Python. That's why we use our virtual environments. And it's pretty quick here. Um, I'm going to check the make a main py file because I don't have one. When you use the templates, I already gave you a main, main py file, so you shouldn't need that one. All right, so we got started. We got our files here. We just gonna go delete all that cruft here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we got a little bit of time, right? We can even start on classes. Right? I don't think we need to do much of a Python primer. Um, so if I were going to write a class that represented something, Right, this idea, we write our classes generally to be object-oriented. This idea is that I'm writing a blueprint for what all the attributes of this object are and all the public functions that this thing can do. Right, do we do, I think we did chair already. Do we already do chair? We didn't do chair. We'll make a class for chair. So we're going to a class for chair. Okay. Now, everything is going to be tabbed under chair right? because it belongs to the chair class here. Now, the chair class, we're going to have our init method. This is our special initialize method that creates an instance of the object. This is our, we call them constructors often in other languages. So how do we make a chair? Right? Well, to make a chair, I'm going to start listing out all of its attributes. So chair is going to have maybe a color, right? So self.color, I'm just going to leave it blank now because I don't know what the color is. We can come back here and figure these out after. I might have a chair dot, um, oh, number of wheels, wheels or legs maybe. We'll, we'll say number of legs. I'm going to start off at zero because I don't know, right? And so uh, how about has wheels? Uh, we'll say it's false. Right? This could just be a true or false, a, a Boolean value. It either has wheels or it doesn't have wheels, right? I don't, well, your chairs do have wheels. Okay, the one over there doesn't. Here, so some chairs don't have wheels, right? We're just, these are possible attributes of a chair, right? And then maybe we have an attribute for height. height. Yeah, there we go. So height, um, I don't know, zero for now. And now anytime you're using a unit, here, you should add what you're measuring this in. If I just say height, I think a lot of people would assume it's inches because America uses a terrible measurement system. But the proper measurement system is metric, right? So we should be measuring height in centimeters or maybe even in meters, right? How about height in meters? It's perfectly fine here. That saves us a little bit of typing because centimeters is harder to spell than meter. Okay, so we'll have height in meters for our chair. Uh, sir? Yeah. So why do we have to put the height at the underscore like after the dot? So uh, the, the, the self dot, if you start with an underscore, that's the convention in Python to say this is a private attribute, don't touch it. So when we go and make chairs and use chairs here, so if we don't have one that's private here, so if I, let's leave height here without the underscore. If I go make a chair, like so this is Eric's chair equals chair, right? Now I can say Eric's chair dot, when I say dot, I'm going to get everything that's public. So right now I can see height in meters because we didn't add the underscore. 
So the underscore is the convention to say this is a private value, a private attribute. Don't go touch it directly here. Now, with height, because it's not private, I can go and say and change it. Let's say this is you know, 1.5 meters. Oh, that's really high. Maybe just one. Even I think one's probably high. 0.75 meters, probably, for a chair. It's probably closer. Um, right? The other attributes, they are still there, and I can go change them. I can say Eric's chair dot color equals red or something, right? Blue, mine's blue. I can go change them directly, but this is really bad habit, bad practice. And if you start accessing private attributes here, Python will let you do it, but you shouldn't assume it will do what it's supposed to do anymore. You, you sort of violated the, the rules of how we should use our classes. Okay, one more new line, there we go. It doesn't like the spelling of Eric's chair. Type one word Eric's. I can't put apostrophes in here though. I don't think it likes apostrophes. No, apostrophes are bad. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we don't want to access, don't access private attributes directly. So if the idea here is we want to have a public interface. We want to give people public functions to use to interact with these things. So we can write methods like a set color that takes a color attribute and says, okay, my self.color will equal that color attribute. And we'll have a public uh, get color function that returns the self.color. So I'll give you access to my color attribute this way. Right, so we can set and get our accessor and mutator or setter and getter or I figure there's another term people use. Um, there, there are all sorts of fun terms for these, but set and get are pretty common here. And it turns out this is so common that the tool knows how to do it for us. So if I go to generate, oh no, it doesn't do it in this one. That's my other program, sorry. That's in Java. Um, we can write them ourselves. It's not too bad, I promise. But sets and gets, does it not? It looks like I've searched for this before, right? People want the function. That's right. So you can add these property things. Ugh. Okay. Uh, it, you can do it with um, properties here. It's a little bit weird. Um, so you can add this at notation to say it's a property. It that's really messy. Like I, I don't like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Sure, it, it's called a decorator. Um, people might use this. I, I'm not fond of it because it's doing too much for us right now behind the scenes. Um, it's cool magic, but we should know what it's doing first. So writing our own sets and gets are probably better right now. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh good, this is not too hot anymore. I can finish drinking this and have a little bit more energy. I'm a little low energy right now, I apologize. Uh. <clears throat> okay, so sets for, get for color. So I'm going to put the underscore back here for height in meters. And then we'll have a defined set uh, has wheels. It takes a has wheels, I guess. Wheels. Self dot has wheels equals has wheels. So we're just taking whatever you give me and setting it here. Now, there's things we can do in here that might make our life a little easier. Like, if I just take what you give me, because Python does not have strong typing, I don't have to give you a Boolean value for true or false, right? I can give you has wheels, I can give you the string yes, and that's what you're going to give me. That's what you're going to keep. So it's a little bit weird here to um, have those values that way. So we can add in some things. So in Python, um, show data types. I think that's what we want here. Let's determine no uh, data type argument. So the book doesn't go through this, uh, but we can start adding parameters here as we go. <clears throat> we can say, hey, this is the type I want here. So if I use this colon notation, so I'm going to say has wheels colon. This is a boolean or bool here. So bool type. It tells, hey, I want and expect to get a boolean value when I give you has wheels. So later on when I, when I use Eric's chair here, when we're not setting height here, so we have Eric's chair, uh, I'll leave that one here. So Eric's chair dot set has wheels, right? It's telling me, hey, I should give it a Boolean type. So I see that show up here in my little, um, uh, what is this, the code completion, the little, uh, IntelliSense here. It's telling me what it's expecting. So now if I give it like, uh, yes, it's saying, hey, it expected type bool, it got a string instead. 
Now it's not an error, right? This will still run, but now we're going to get some checking here and we're going to get warnings at least to tell the, the user, hey, you gave it something it doesn't expect. Python's still going to work with it here and it, it will do the same thing, but it's if we don't have this check here for this Boolean type, it won't tell us at all. So if I leave that out here, I just give it yes and it's happy. You have no, no way of knowing that you gave it the wrong type here. So you can add this type ex expectations here to get the compile time warnings. And it's not even really, sorry, not even compile, but to get compiler um, interpreter warnings. Right? So if we add in, hey, this is the type I'm expecting, we'll warn people when they give us bad things which is a step in the right direction. So this is specific to Python 3, and it's, it's a newer thing. Some Python examples you see will use this, some won't. So if you see this crazy, hey, colon, here's the type here, this is all it means. But we're just giving some, some type hints, essentially, here, saying this is what you should be giving me, which is nice. Um, and then if you're going to return values like git has wheels or something like that, you'd use the little arrow notation. Um, which is fun notation to say, hey, this is the type I'm going to give you back. So it's arrow, this is a bool, before the colon. So that when you're using git has wheels, we know it should be giving me back a boolean value. So this indicates it's, it will return a boolean. And then we can return self.has wheels. Right? So this is some cool notation here. Uh, this indicates. Has wheels should be a bool. Should be a bool. There we go. Sometimes I can type right. Is that helpful to throw in those notes there? Just as a quick refresher. So now I get this versus set has wheels, like if I were to say true. Right? Now I won't get the warning because I'm giving it a Boolean value here. Okay? Um, and then for the, the git has wheels, again, that's just telling me that it will give me back a boolean value. So if we're to say something like I don't know, value is git has wheels, we know that this will, should be a boolean type is all um, as we're looking at our function. Because it tells me, hey, it's going to return a boolean type. So that's some helpful stuff you can put in there um, to make it make a little bit more sense for people. So again, when we're writing code, if it's just for us, we probably know what it's doing. But if we're working with other people, having this extra information about, hey, this will give you back a list, or this will give you back a tuple, or this will give you back this type of information here is useful, and we're putting it right in our code. So it's not like you could add a comment here and say, hey, you know, some people would say, uh, git has wheels, wheels returns a Boolean value of if it has wheels or not, or something like that. Like this as a text comment is not super useful here, right? But adding it into our code with this code notation means it will show up here this way. Does that make sense? And you could do it like as the was it the function comment here with the triple triple notation. I think it's this way, right? If it has wheels. Is that, is that where is it here? Is it on the same line? I forget here. What's the function comment? Uh, Python. I can't spell Python. Ah, it's underneath. There we go. So if I put it under here, that's what it is. You can do a triple quote comment here. Now when I hover over git has wheels, git has wheels returns a boolean value of if it has wheels. So this is a text-based comment here. You know, uh, text-based text -based comment documentation versus uh, code-based documentation. And again, I'm definitely very biased against comments. I think I told you that story, documentation. Um, back when I took my first programming class, it was 2004, because I'm an old person now. Um, I actually took it in high school, because my school was cool, or not cool enough to have its own coding class. So they paid for me to go to the community college and take a class, which I thought I was super cool, taking a college class in high school. Um, and it was fun, I got out early too, which was really nice. Um, that was not useful information, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but the assignment, anyway, uh, I had an assignment to do something, and it did all the right things, but I didn't get an A on it because the teacher decided that you had to have comments on all of your methods and functions to get full points. And I was super pissed because it did all the right things. I just didn't add useless comments, which, of course, I thought were useless at the time and still think are useless. So I swore in 2004, if I ever had a chance to teach, I would not take away points for people whose code works if they don't have comments. 
because comments are stupid. Now, again, there's good places for comments. Comments can be very useful. Uh, but again, code that actually works and runs is what we really care about. Adding in comments generally means that your code should be better. If you have to add a comment to explain what's happening, you didn't do it cleaner enough in your code. And that's a little bit of a pipe dream, a little bit of rainbows and unicorns. And sometimes things are so weird and complex, you just have to add a comment and explain it. But that should be the exception, not the rule. Right? Other profs, when you get on and take other coding classes, will have you do silly things like add comments for every function. Just smile and nod because they're the ones assessing you, right? And if they're going to give you points for it or take points away for not doing it, then you want to get the points, right? Um, other silly things I see a lot here, people would say, you know, here's the chair class, um, author Eric, last modified, uh, January 9th sort of thing. All of this stuff here is in GitHub, right? I know it's the chair class because that's in my code. I know who the author is because GitHub I wrote the commit. I know what the time was last modified because GitHub tracks that. Right? All of this is worthless information here, just cluttering up the top. If you like doing it, go for it. If it makes you happy, that's fine. I'm, I will be like the compiler or the interpreter and ignore your comments. I generally don't ever look at them. Right? If you want to leave funny notes, that's fine. Maybe I'll see them eventually. But generally, I see a comment and I just my brain says ignore it because it's useless. Um, it's kind of sort of how I was going. Now, this sort of text-based documentation can be very useful. right? But the code-based version, I think, is more practical. It's going to be a little bit easier here. When you write a library for someone to use, like if you want to write code that other people will use lots of places, having good documentation is very helpful. Let's be honest, this is our second semester coding. No one is going to use our code as a library that thousands of people will download, or tens of thousands of people will download, or you know, millions of people. Where's the uh, Python test library? Download stats, something like that. Requests project. Uh, 337 million downloads per month of this requests library. Them having good documentation and good comments, very, 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 very useful because it helps 337 million people a month. Not exactly because this is like every time the program runs, like, but you get the idea. Right? This is a very popular library. Okay, This is where it's useful to have this sort of documentation, right? which is great. And they've got a cool website that has it all for us here and we can see it all. Right, We can actually look at the documentation on their website and see, hey, what, how do you do custom headers? And they're like giving us good examples. And this is amazing. Love this one. Uh, we'll use requests later because this lets us get web data and go out to a, a web API and say, give me some data, please. And then we can play with the data, which is really fun. There used to be a really good finance API that was free, but they, they took away the free bit of it. And it was really sad because um, obviously it was really fun data. And everyone wanted to play with it. And they're like, hey, we should start charging for it, which is fine. Like businesses have to make money. I get it. Um, but that's a really cool one. So some comments are great. Most of the time they're useless, right? The code-based hints here are super helpful and they help us do the right thing. Um, all right, so back to our chair. So we've got color, we've got a uh, number of legs. Now, just sets and gets here for color. I don't really care what color you tell me, right? And if it's not a real word, if it's not a real color, we can just pretend we're a Crayola crayon and you just made up a new color because that's what Crayola has to do, right? There's not thousands and thousands and thousands of colors out there. Um, hey, what is 256 times 250, what's 256 to the third? 256 to the third. I guess there's 16 million colors So, uh, in our 256-bit system that our computers can generate. But um, that's a lot of crayons, I guess. They're not all that different. RGB yeah, RGB. Yeah, from 0 to 255 for RGB. Um, you can get a lot of different color combinations, right? 256 reds, 256 greens, 256 blues, all your permutations. Or be com combinations? I think it's combinations. Because, yeah, the order doesn't matter. But anyway, rabbit trails, I'm sorry. It happens. Um, for color, I'm not going to define a list of colors. But for height, right, when we have a method like set height here in meters, meters, right, I might say I want a height in meters, meters. Now, this one is going to be a type of double or float, right, a floating point value. Right? Not an integer. It should be a floating point value. So an invalid height, something I shouldn't let you set the height to, we can say, hey, if my height in meters is less than zero, right? you can't have a negative height that, that does not exist in the laws of physics. Right? I mean, at that point, you have a hole in the ground. You don't have a chair. Right? 
if you say my chair is a negative height, I think that doesn't work, right? So if the height is less than zero, we want to do something about it. So in our case, we're going to take the easy route here. We'll just say height is zero. You now are sitting on the floor if you try and have a negative height chair. That's fine, right? Otherwise then, right, then we can set our self height in meters to the height in meters, right? We'll accept your value. So if it is zero, great. Otherwise this. And now if you want to get particular here and say, hey, I want to save one line of code, because some people care about this sort of stuff here. And you'll see this, uh, the author loves doing this sort of stuff a lot too. So instead of saying self to height of meter equals zero, he's going to change the attribute here to height is zero, and then just go and set the value to that height. Right, so that saves the else. Some people prefer that style. Some people think it's silly. You're going to see a lot of different ways. But either way, we're, the same result is happening here. right? Either we're setting it to 0 and then setting it, or if it's not 0, we're keeping the value as is and setting it. Right? We're doing the same thing here, just a different style. So you'll see this sort of thing a lot from the author. Um, he likes saving as much many lines of code as he can. I don't know who he's trying to impress, because we're just trying to learn Python here. I don't want shortcuts. I want to learn what it's doing. But again, I didn't write the textbook, so I, I can only complain about it. Because writing a textbook is a lot of, lot of pain and trouble and hassle, and I don't like filling out paperwork, so I'm not going to write a textbook. All right, so when we have set values, right, one of the goals of set values, right, with good object-oriented programming, object-oriented programming goal is encapsulation. Right? This idea of taking all the details and encapsulating them in one nice little package and as part of doing that here, we're going to protect the integrity of our class. Oriented. Did I spell it wrong? What does it want to do here? It wants a dash. Why? Okay. So protecting the integrity of our class means making sure we have valid values for attributes. Right? Don't let someone give you an invalid attribute value. We can do that. We can control what height gets set to when people use our public function for set height in meters. Right? If I just give you a public height in meters attribute, you can go set it to anything you want. You could set it to negative 50 billion. Python will let you do that. So when we write classes and we take advantage of this idea of data hiding, we're encapsulating all the details away, giving these private attributes with public functions, we get to do sanity checks right? or bounds checking. What is a valid bound or valid range for this value and make sure it fits? Right? If we don't want height to go above five meters, I don't know, if we said, hey, there's a maximum height for chairs because we get to do that, it's our code, we could do that as well. We could check for a minimum and a maximum. Right? Anything that, that fits here, we can do with our chair class. Now, did we do the vehicle class last semester? I'm losing my, my memory here. We had a vehicle, right? So vehicle had certain values here. You can't charge your battery more, you put more gas in the tank than we were allowed. Or, yeah. So, you might have mins and maxes, right? We want to make sure that things stay within bounds. That, that's sort of the idea here with our object-oriented classes. Uh, so, and that's one of the, the bonuses or benefits of having this abstract interface that we work with. They work with public functions, and then our public functions ensure the integrity of our class. No one needs to know how it works. They, they don't need to know the details of how the chair class works. We don't need to know the details of how the request library does what it does. We just need to know if I ask for a website, it gives me the website back. Right? We're working with the abstract function that it provides. Here's all the public things it does. You want to grab a website? Sure. Go and get the get this website and then go and get the text. Right? Go and get it as JSON. Whatever you want here. We'll go it will do as advertised. And that's what we're going to do for it here. So we got our sets, we got our gets. Uh, we didn't do all of them here. That's okay. Um, but now that I can make chairs, right, we can do other things with our chairs, right, which is fun. So we can take chairs and we can pass chairs around. So I could write my own functions if I wanted. So define, I don't know, like print chair details that takes a chair. So if I pass a chair here, and I can even use the chair of the notation here. Hey, I want a type of chair here to be given to this function for print chair details. We're going to print chair.getColor, right? And then we're going to print chair.getHasWheels, right? That's the only gets we have right now, but that's fine. So we can print out the details. We can call our print chair details, given Eric's chair. We can pass the object we've created to this function, and we're good to go. Oh, it's 3.15. Sorry. I think people are at the door already waiting for the next class. Let me just hit run. We'll get our detail. It's blue, and it has wheels. 
Right, you gotta holler at me if I'm going over. I'm sorry. So let me commit this here. That's a quick review. So hello world. Oh, oh review. Oops. I guess we did a little more than hello world. All right, so we'll be back up Thursday. We'll talk more about objects and classes and inheritance and get moving there. Uh, if you got questions, let me know. I'll post this out on YouTube.